Hello and welcome back to the Folk Podcast, episode 85. We're doing a video podcast here, which means I am looking at the camera and I wasn't doing that. But we are back here today to discuss to, to discuss a little bit more about my trip here in Europe. Um, I did release a video last week um, kind of talking about what my plans are here. Um, but specifically, I want to expand upon this idea of North American paganism and how it is different and how it seemingly is different. Um, and so I also have Claire here. So she, uh, Claire is our fellowship leader or fellowship trainee uh, currently, but about to have our first Netherlands gathering internationally here in a few weeks. Uh, so Claire, you are our European representative. Are you, are, are you excited to represent the whole of Europe in this conversation? The whole of Europe. Okay. I am <laughs> from the Netherlands, so uh, I, can, I can speak a, lot, a little bit of that area, of course. But yeah, it's very cool to be a fellowship trainee leader of europe that i on can the, on the edge put on the yeah. gathering for like the european people it's it's, it's cool it's i really cool. can't believe that is oh my gosh we are literally like a month away like we are four weeks away at the time of recording this yes, yes. that's crazy Whew. <laughs> absolutely crazy um so essentially the last uh basically two weeks ago at this point i spent a week in amsterdam um so this week was purely vacation it was actually my friends that are non-pagans uh, one of my friends who's got a really cool job honestly he works as a can i say this i think i can say it. he works as a diplomat uh in africa for the US government. And so he gets like a month off of vacation every year. And so he got it in Europe this year. So he's just been traveling around and he invited myself and then other friends back from uh, Lexington to come visit him and join him in Amsterdam. And we had a week um, and it was a lot of fun, but I definitely was thinking a lot about this idea as I have returned of the differences between North American pagans and European pagans as people that are from the countries of, you know, Norse paganism, Slavic paganism, Celtic paganism. Um, and how those ideas are still kind of around, but in North America, we just don't have that. So I do kind of want to do a, like a little bit of roundabout here. So Ian, we'll start with you, then go to Caleb, and then Claire for the uh, for the Netherlands. Um, but when I say North American paganism to you, Ian, and to you, Caleb, uh, you know, what do you think about that? Like, what do you think about this concept? I mean, I think like in the video that you did, yeah, you said almost two years ago, I, I feel like you touched on it pretty well as far as you know, we are we are kind of doing our own representation and our own uh, uh, reworking of of a faith or a practice that was obviously primarily focused on and practiced in in Northern Europe. Um, and I think it's it's just our own flavor of things. I mean, that's kind of how a lot of religions ended up changing over the over the centuries and millennia when they moved to different regions, each group kind of picked their own things that they wanted to take from it or practice it based off of where they were at. Um, I mean, even like, even to look at it with Greek and Roman uh, paganism, so to speak, like they're not that far apart, but they were still so very different. You know, now imagine obviously across an entire ocean and being in a region, you know, that has so many different environmental factors that can change the way somebody views views paganism as a whole you know obviously you've been up here in minnesota it's it's pretty similar to a lot of northern european uh environments hence why i think a lot of people around here are you know primarily german scandinavian descendants um, definitely the love of cheese is still very prevalent yes very much so especially if you're from wisconsin um <clears throat> but yeah i feel like i feel like it's just one of those things that it's kind of been seen throughout various religions uh, in the past where just the slightest regional change to things has its own different flavor, so to speak, to it. But at its roots has, you know, they're the same, or at least the same idea or, or, or purpose behind it. Yeah, without trying to uh, repeat too much of what Ian said, it's, I kind of view it kind of uh, like, uh, just how different tribes in Scandinavia or even looking at like people in Sweden versus people in Norway would have practiced the faith. It's going to be different because, you know, they're, you have different forests, you have different local areas, you have different local traditions um, because there may be a hill somewhere in Norway that they say that that's where the ancestors are. And then a hill that looks very similar down in Sweden could be where they say that the, the uh, elves or the dwarves are. Uh, just 
different areas have will, you know, they develop differently. And I believe we've, we've been the, uh, brought in like, uh, yes, we do, we do like a lot of meditations and things like that that people say that we take, that we've kind of uh, adopted from like Buddhism and other, uh, other, I don't know, let's see, I, I guess Eastern or, yeah, like the Eastern spiritualities, like Buddhism, Taoism, all, all that. So we're definitely doing something different than the ancestors did. Yeah, I mean, I, I can agree. It's also definitely on the fact like it's all a little bit, we have, they have every culture kind of has the same deities, the same kind of, um, they all have this, the same categories. They just prioritize it differently based on their culture, their uh, climate even, you see them, right? Like more up north, they have, for instance, like Thor and Odin are more prominent. And when you look down, you have like Zeus is more of a thunder god and they're up with the sky. It's a little bit different. Um, so I definitely think that is something culturally wise that you can definitely, um, has the similarities, same categories. Um, but also, it's also interesting that you, Caleb, mentioned like the Buddhism part, because when I would look specifically at the Netherlands, like meditation and um especially with like shamanic retreats we still a lot have that buddhism thing to it that that silence yoga um i know from a silent retreat i've recently been to that the minister of yoga from india recently uh frequently visits the netherlands and regions to see how we meditate here because some for some reason it's something we uh, we have our own way of doing but it definitely speaks their attention so we definitely have something going on here too that um that is interesting enough to visit at least um but i think um definitely from like the more european perspective it's it's a it's very sober um as in it's pretty common to go to i say a spiritual retreat or a shamanic retreat and just doesn't matter what you believe in. You can be Christian, you can be atheist, you can be Buddhist, you can be Norse pagan. Everybody kind of has something, right? Well, one question for you, Claire, um, in, at least in your experience uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, now, I did see a little bit in Amsterdam specifically. There was actually a couple of people that had like signs saying that like Jesus loves you. In fact, in like the main building right outside the train station, it literally says like, Jesus loves you on like glowing neon sign on like one of the really old cathedrals. Um, and that's the first time I've been, ever encountered anything like that here in, in at least in Europe in my travels. Um, and that something like that is very prevalent in the States, especially the South. Um, and so I think that's one of the reasons that like people can go to like a shamanic retreat and feel like they can just, you know, they can be Buddhist, they can be Hindu, they can be Christian. It's because um, Christianity is much less aggressive here at, at least in my experience, would you say that's something, you know, you would kind of agree with? Yeah, of, co of course, we have a Bible Belt, too. I think every country here has some kind of region where uh, Christi Christianity is very dominant still. Um, and there's still people who follow it, but I it, it don't see it that often. Uh, sometimes around Easter or something around Christmas, you sometimes see people around in the city like flyer like hey come and visit the church jesus loves you loves you that kind of stuff and people are like mostly even though you don't believe it they accept the flyer and like thanks have a nice day and then they move on right it's it's like you do you kind of idea sometimes you get a little bit of a discussion because some people like to look that up of course um but generally it, it's okay for everybody also as well to just go to church I mean, I sometimes also visit a church to light a candle, not because I'm Christian, but if you if you've ever seen like churches here in Europe, that kind of Gothic style they have, they look beautiful, and everybody sometimes just looks inside to, to admire its architecture uh, and maybe light a candle, and it doesn't really matter what you're what you're from, and they also don't really care that much. Um, so yeah, definitely from what I've been experiencing, it's not that much. You have groups, you have extremists everywhere, but 
it's not something you're confronted with weekly, monthly, maybe like once a year or like around those holidays like Easter or Christmas. Um, or around the red okay. light district in Amsterdam. <laughs> it, it, like that, yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, it was I don't know about wavering. It was specifically around the entrances to the red light district. Not that I partook, I only observed because I was curious. <laughs> but um, they, they were specifically around, like, right before the entrance, like, right before, like, the big giant, like, red light district started. They were just like, Jesus loves you. Like, don't go in there. <laughs> yeah. Stuff like that, you often see it, or um, around train stations or other locations where people normally sin, if I can put it that way. Um, you sometimes see, see them there, but it, generally it's it's harmless. It uh, sounds it's like treated it's treated as such. It, it sounds like it's almost more strategically placed in Europe compared to like what you were saying, Jacob, with like here in America. I mean, like when we, uh, we had the Wisconsin gathering, there was a good solid, it was right when I crossed over from the Minnesota into Wisconsin border, there was at least five to six billboards just in a row, just all of it being, you know, like you said, very aggressively, like Jesus loves you. If you don't follow Jesus, you're going to hell and blah, 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 like all this stuff. And it's so aggressive and it's just in the most random places. Like, yeah, I get it on the side of an interstate is somewhat strategic but it's just like boom 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 and it just floods you with everything no no and no it's, it's like, strategic when it's right next to a porn store okay i was just getting to that because then usually it's like that and then you go like another two or three miles down the road and it's like a big billboard for adult superstore kind of thing but every now and then there are some random ones where it's literally just five or six billboards of just you know repent and blah 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 like aggressive aggressive just uh you know christian influence or push and then it's just nothing for like the rest of the mile you know for miles until you like hit another town or something like that so, yeah it, it seems like it's yeah i agree with the, it's definitely i mean i haven't been to europe in the sense of like being able to really explore it yet but based off of what i've been told and just have kind of seen just through like videos of people doing european tours like i i watch for weird things like that just instinctively um it definitely seems like it's way more aggressive here and it sounds like it's just more strategic as far as where they're placing things i mean i live in the south so I, that's like every day for me like if i go see my grandparents there's like always it's they have, I don't know how many years in a row, probably at least 10 or 15, these people have had the same like four bill billboards in a row, like as you enter the county that uh, I grew up in. And it's all, you know, it, it'll change every now and then, but it's basically like you're going to hell. That's basically all it says. They just change a few words at the beginning of it every now and then. Yeah. I mean, it's still something that happens here, but it's more like after closed doors for the people who want to hear it or believe in it it's more the um protestant kind of way like you're going to hell anyway you just have to leave your life to redeem yourself that kind of approach um it happens i know it, it but it, i i've never we should take I, you to a drive down i-75 through kentucky to, to tennessee oh. and show you what you'll see you'll see a dinosaur on the side of the road you see the corvette museum you're gonna see an adult <laughs> superstore next to a giant cross that jesus himself carried down from mount calvary <laughs> i think i would have a massively culture shock oh it's <laughs> honestly, never been when to i the go US, back so when I go back, I'm thrown off because, you know, I'm just like, holy shit, I haven't seen this for three months. And I'm like, all like way more aware of it now. You know, I come back and I'm like, it's everywhere, it, you know, but I think I block it out now that I've lived in Kentucky so long. But I mean, you drive any Kentucky road for more than 30 minutes, you're going to see something like it. Mm -hmm. Now, as far into maybe a little bit more of a funnier subject here. So first off, Claire, what is Dutch? What is the Dutch language? <laughs> what? Honestly, what is... I have no idea. It's like a combination of so many things. I think when people hear me speak, like speak Dutch, they're the first thing they ask, like, are you having a stroke? Should I get you some water? Or it, it's, um, we have also different like Dutch languages. I mean, I'm from what? the South. 
So um, yeah, we have Frisian, we have Limburgs, we have Brabants, we have ABN, uh, we have Twents. Uh, <laughs> I've heard Dutch they described. Have a kind of, uh, <laughs> I've seen yeah. it described as like a very aggressive, angry German, and Germans are already okay. angry and aggressive. It's it's just a lot of. <laughs> yeah, that's also it's like South, Welsh. Is, Especially the the G sound, I feel, is something that really throws off people when they hear it. Um, but in the south, it's soft. It's kind of when you're um, like a cat hissing, like. <sighs> but when you go up north, it's like almost like you're choking. It's, <sighs> it's <laughs> like if you say "good morning" is in Dutch "goedemorgen," so, something like that. It's like a very. But here in the south, it will say "goedemorgen." with a very soft oh, okay, so okay. and then we have frisian uh i don't know frisian it's a completely different language because the only countries that, that speak similar. dutch are the netherlands and part of belgium right uh i believe in uh who oh, in curacao and the dutch uh do, do, do. there are some caribbean parts oh that's there. right yes you still have a caribbean colony i believe and then yeah. and then there i think isn't there a country curacao in south america that actually was a dutch colony as well and it's a country i've never yeah, heard of because i saw restaurants there. for them and in south yeah yeah and then like indonesia as well actually was a dutch colony which i find baffling because we went to an indonesian restaurant nicest owner i have ever met in my life like he was seriously so sweet but i've never had indonesian food and like the guy we were with was dutch and he was telling us about like the dutch colony that used to be in indonesia and how like the food mix and it got real fucking weird <laughs> yeah yeah in Suriname they also speak dutch and in yeah african is it sounds a little bit like dutch like i can understand african but and they can understand me but i have i i can't i can't like make sentences we can understand each other <laughs> so a really funny story so, uh one of the nights it was the longest night we were out to like 3 3, 3 30 in the morning it was with the dutch guy he was just taking us to all these little dutch bars and stuff and we were waiting for our uber and there was a, an african gentleman who was dutch obviously and we were asking him and my very kentucky friend was just like so man where are you from and i think he said ethiopia and he's like well man how did you get here and he's like i walked and we were like, oh, that's so funny. And he's like, I walked. And we're like, oh, you walked. <laughs> Holy shit. Oof. Yeah. No, Impressive. but uh, honestly, like, I feel like this is a good kind of like uh, combination of it all. Um, like, of course, to me, of course, North American paganism is going to be different, whether we worship the same gods or not. Um, just for that example of like the uh, Indonesian food, like is Indonesia its own unique place? Yes. But is part of Indonesia's history, the Dutch were colonizing there? Yes. So the cul cultures merged and they created something from it. Indonesian people moved to, um, to Holland and then Dutch people moved to Indonesia. And that is going to create different cultures, different subgroups of cultures. I mean, the very reason that Dutch has so many offshoots of languages is because of this as well. We're a trade country, so, and, and uh, the whole thing about the Netherlands is that the Netherlands always has been quite neutral throughout history because of trade. So it's also a very common thing for us to know multiple languages, to um, be open to different cultures. That's something that is still here in the Netherlands. That's why uh, cities like Amsterdam are like, oh, they're so tolerant to everybody, right? Everybody is welcome. Um, Although when you move a little bit more in the country, you might notice differently. We're very direct in the Netherlands, but um, that is our image, right? It, it's everybody is kind of welcome. We are the trade country. Um, so yeah, the, I think that's also with, with the language that a lot of it got like mixed, mis mismatched. Um, but especially in the North, you will see that the accent and the languages there are, are more similar to the Scandinavian languages. And south, you more see kind of, I wouldn't say French, but it's definitely a little bit softer compared to uh, to what they speak up north because they also have the harsh sound, um, which we do not have necessarily in the uh, in the south. I feel like that's kind of a regular thing in being just in northern parts of regions. 
because like as you're saying that with like somewhat harsher like pronunciations of things like Minnesota a lot of us up here like in the northern parts of the United States I feel like we tend to say our O's slightly harsher in a different way or like we we uh exaggerate it a little bit like for me for example as I say when I say opinion I usually exaggerate that O in front of it and I, it usually comes out as like opinion and then even like in the UK, I know more of like up in Northern um, Europe, not quite into Scotland, but I'm sure this has to do with the fact that Scotland is right there. A lot more people have a, a thicker accent focused around like the way that they pronounce like O's and things like that. So it's, it's kind of funny, like kind of this, like it was just a thought that popped into my head, like just thinking about it, like how Northern regions have like a little bit slightly more aggressive, like pronunciation of certain things compared to like the South. Cause like, We've got, you know, Caleb on here with that smooth Tennessee whiskey accent going on. Well, see, if you ask anybody in the United States, like, where my, right, where people with accents are, they always say that it's the South. And if they, and if anybody ever from up North ever tries to sound stupid, they try to sound like me. Yeah. Same here. Like, Frisian is the only exception. But generally, uh, what is spoken in Amsterdam and that region of North and Mid is considered normal dutch and then we are the, have the south like the the, the party animals kind of sometimes how we refer to because in the south we celebrate carnival that's not something that happens all over the country uh so we are always more the south of countries that are like try to be different <laughs> because like the same thing with bavaria and germany bavaria is very independent and has their own you know own language their own culture um, and kind of like, we'll just deal with being part of the North for now, you know, but Bavaria will rise again. <laughs> I think like Germany's thing is like, all their regions are so different because all those regions used to be like their own kingdoms and stuff until like the last 150, 200 years, something like that. What, yeah, was literally it, like, it was like 1840 they combined or something like that. Yeah. So but Bavaria I mean, I was the last just a one. Lot of that old yeah, there's a lot of that old tradition still alive and well in them. Yeah. I mean, Belgium used to be part of the Netherlands too, but then they decided to, that they were on uh, their own country. Yeah, let's make our small country even smaller. It'll be a great idea. There's even a smaller country, like next to Belgium, um, Germany, and the Netherlands, Luxembourg. Yeah, I was going to say Luxembourg, right? It's like they have, the I'm supposing they have their it's own language too. You, you're fine with Dutch, you're fine with German, but mostly I believe they speak French there. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay. <laughs> so you guys want a funny story. So, and I, th I feel like I can say this because we don't have a French person in here. Um, and we only have another European. But I met my first, like, French French person. Like, my first super, super rude French person. And it was honestly an amazing experience because I was like, you know what? At least I'm not the French. <laughs> so I was at uh, I was at the Amsterdam train station waiting for my friends to get done uh, with like a museum they were doing. And so I was there like an hour early, just like drinking some coffee. And there was a woman. I, and keep in mind, I'm at a long table, like a long table. She is way on the other end. Um, and the waiter who comes over and they, they're speaking French to each other. Um, I couldn't tell enough French to know what she was saying for the most part. And so he brings this sandwich to her, and it was technically a French cafe, if that gives her the right to do this. But she was like, what is this? This is not French bread. This is our prostitution of France. And she throws the bread on the plate and, like, explodes the lettuce everywhere. And it, like, scatters all over the table. And she's just going off in French about, she's like, your owner likes to rape the French people. He like, She likes to steal from us, huh? She likes to steal our food, steal our bread, steal our recipes, and then ruin them. And she was just going ham, dude. <laughs> I'm just sitting there trying to like drink my coffee. I think she said something to me like, can you believe the prostitution of the French? And I was just like, <laughs> just trying to like chill out. And, uh, you know, and the waiter walks away. He's just like, I'm not dealing with this chick. And I'm like, I don't blame you, dude. You don't get tips here. And um, so she's sitting there and then she's just picking up food and like looking at it and like pretentiously like observing it and then throwing it onto the plate. Uh, I think she takes like two or three bites and eventually, I don't even think she pays. She just gets up and again says like, this is a prostitution of France. And then like 
storms out of the building. <laughs> and I'm just sitting there like, wow. Like, that was incredible. <laughs> and I'm thinking that their baguette is not even French. That's from Austria. And Ooh. I think their cheese also isn't, technically. A prostitution. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell them that. But for the people I know who speak French, mostly people want to speak French because they the cursing is just so, they have a lot of curse words. And I, I have heard that cursing in French is so satisfying if you can do it fluently. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I think it's just that like, you just like savage somebody just like, yeah, I cursed you out. En français. <laughs> Oh, yeah, but that's kind of like, you know, kind of, I don't really confirm it. It's one example, but yeah, I've always heard that like people in France are kind of assholes, but that's kind of a funny thing. It's just Only me. some of them, mostly from Paris, them, I believe. So yeah. Yeah. From Paris. So getting more into the paganism side, once again, um, Claire, I'm sure we talked about this a little bit on your first episode that you were on the podcast. And for anyone that doesn't know, she was on the podcast, I believe it was called Loki, the trickster magician of the Netherlands or something like that. It was quite a while ago something at this like point. Um, episode 25. Damn, you still have remembered. Do you have it tattooed <laughs> somewhere? Like, was on episode 25? Actually, yes. Uh, coincidentally, I have it in my room tattoo. It's like the key lock in here, the kind of since 25. What? Yeah. Oh, it does. <laughs> what? You see? Did you get that after or before? No, 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 no. Like two years before I joined the server in general. No way. And, and I was like, like, it's also my first rune tattoo. Yeah. And this is episode <laughs> 85. So we're 60 episodes later. Because I remember someone asking, like, why did. Oh. And I remember someone like saying to me, like, why did you t tattoo 25 on yourself? Like, oh, that was pure coincidental. Like, because I was on the, like, the design of the, the lock. And then, <laughs> like, in, in a few years, I'll be on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I can feel it. I have dominated uh, it. Yeah. Um, it so, always felt like that. Like, I was, like, looking up, like, what episode will I be? And I was like, 25. That's interesting. But, as the French yeah. will say, <laughs> Belfi. Um, so <laughs> what I was going to ask you, I mean, I can't remember if we asked you that 60 episodes ago, um, but as far, maybe try to blend it in with like your experiences growing up in the Netherlands, growing up in Europe, um, how was getting into paganism, you know, like, do you feel like your environment, you know, guided you in that way or yeah, just kind of talk about your environment and getting into paganism. Mm, well, a little bit of background. My mother oh, and my, my both my parents all, uh, always have been very spiritually active. My dad is a huge history nerd. If it's about anything specifically Hellenistic, so Greek, Asian stuff, and I grew up with that. But also Scandinavian lore and uh, everything surrounding that. Uh, besides school as well, uh, my mother is and still is a medium, so she does a lot of divination stuff. We used to live from that, um, which actually is a pretty decent job to have here <laughs> um you can actually get a degree here in the netherlands you can officially be a witch um it's recognized by the government which is pretty cool but um well me as a child growing up i went to a lot of like fairs and conventions and festivals with people doing divination doing meditation selling crystals jewelry um taking aura pictures even um, to, for me, was pretty normal. Um, I've always been a very uh, high sensitive and creative kid. And this was kind of my way. It was kind of for me an outlet in, in, in a sense, like um, I could be, my emotions were seen. Uh, I could say what I wanted. It was okay to see or feel different things. And my parents were always very supportive of that. And it was just considered normal. And thinking that I even went to technically a Catholic school. It's also fine if I if I brought it up. Um, but yeah, I, I never really stopped going there. My parents still are in that world and we still sometimes uh, go to shamanic retreats or silent retreats or spiritual conventions if you like to. Uh, and I remember actually a very specific thing that we actually sit on in the parking lot before going to a convention. And my mother was like, we need to teach you how to protect yourself. And we did a meditation in the car in the middle of a parking lot, how to protect yourself and all the energies we're going to kind of take in. And that was like the most normal thing. Uh, that's something we did. And then afterwards, we 
cleansed, right? We, uh, so we had a crystal, we talked about it, or during a drive home, we just were silent. It, it, it was very okay. But also thinking back about all those conventions I went to, you saw all, t all different kinds of people there. Like, I cannot really think of a stereotype I saw there, like the stereotypical hippie or, or pagan or Viking or thing, just anything that pops up uh, into your uh, head if you think about a pagan or a witch or whatnot. I don't remember that stereotype. It was just like the common Dutch person who walked there. Um, but also with festivals, uh, I think one of the most famous festivals is maybe the one um, from Heilum, where you, you type Heilum in that Lifa al uh, album. That was in uh, a festival in the Netherlands called Kastelfest, which I frequently go to. Um, never went with my parents, but there are multiple um, festivals like that. And all types of people. There are marketplaces, you can meditate within a group, within a tent, you can have readings. Um, and it's often combined with all kinds of merchandise and clothing and drinks and, but it attracts all, like families, like with children and all, and it's, it's normal. Um, of course, you also have like the extreme types, like go into this, this tent, pay 10 euros and meet a unicorn. Like, that's the kind of thing you want to pass. Um, Bro, where, the, where are we meeting unicorns at? Only 10 euro? Jeez. Yeah. you have a whole meditation about meeting celestial beings it's a thing it's a thing and it's uh and people do it like oh well, i kind of want to experience that and then i just go in um i but uh yeah i feel like a lot of that like i read a i read an article not that long ago well it was i'd say a few years back um and i know it was kind of talking about just the difference in the way that europe is uh, just as a, Europe is in general with religious views as far as being so much more like acceptant of so many different things and not really being so like critical of what you practice and what you preach basically compared to the U.S. And their main argument, which it makes sense if you if you really think about it, uh, you know, a lot of these practices and stuff have been in Europe for thousands of years you know and european history in general is old whereas you have the united states are the entire like premise behind the creation of the united states was basically a group of of a branch off of christianity and that's why they left and that's essentially what the u.s was founded on um you know that's why we still have in god we trust on our on a lot of our dollar bill like on any of our currency you know it's so and the u.s has only been around for let me think here 75 less than 300 years so yeah less than 300 years you know mm -hmm. that is in the span of like existence and culture that is nothing and that's why like think of an eye yeah yeah exactly that's hey, why, we've like, been around longer than the dutch monarchy <laughs> that's true that's 100 <laughs> percent true <laughs> But like, yeah, I think, like, I what's, think what's that this, has a huge effect of this. Bro, like, what the story I was told, like, Napoleon, when he came into to the Netherlands and to Holland, he established a monarchy to help him rule. And then when they kicked him out, they were like, you know what? We kind of like this monarchy thing. Let's go ahead and keep it. Yeah, it was kind of to keep outsider countries out um, because I believe the reason was is because we then had created a monarchy. We were taken more seriously by other countries because it's more intense to attack a monarchy, I guess, than just a republic or some, just some, some standalone at that time. That's what I remember from my history lessons all those years ago, but it, it was to protect generally the country. Now, and uh, uh, Den Hague, uh, or The Hague, uh, I, the Peace Palace there was really cool. Like, honestly, it just looked really cool. Like, obviously it's not used for any like like regal purposes anymore it's actually where they try like war crimes now which is really interesting but i really loved and like even like the parliament building in in the hague was really beautiful i was like wow this is like i really like the hague honestly mm. yeah, it's it's like uh, where um 
it's, it's like the world's court, right? Especially from Europe, the big criminals, the big guys are brought to then Hague to be judged. So the, the, the kind of has a reputation, like justice is served in Den Hague. Uh, yeah, I've never, have I been there? I think maybe once, but it's, it's only like an hour there. away from you because the Netherlands is like yeah. this big. The Netherlands yeah. is smaller than Kentucky. <laughs> Yes. Oh, wait. yes. For real? Yes. That was yes. my re- yeah. It's that was my reaction. Small. That was my reaction when he said that. I was like, no, it's not. Yeah, like literally, like, like you know, it's like a weird kind of shape, and then like I was like Amsterdam's kind of in the middle west, and then the uh, Hague <laughs> is like a little bit towards yeah. the south, and that was only like an hour, and I'm like, like I'm on the border of the country already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think within a good four to five hours, you can go from south all the way up to north. Now, I will say I had an, a, an absolutely state, amazing time really. talking to uh, the, the the Dutch person that like gave us a tour. Like my friend who was in Africa knew this guy from his job, and he gave us like a tour and like answered all of our questions and stuff. So that's where I learned a lot about this stuff. And he was saying that like I was surprised because I was like, oh, what's the Netherlands population? Is it like four or five million? Because that's what I was going on based on Switzerland. And he's like, no, it's like eighteen million. I'm like, what? There's eighteen million people yeah. in a place that's smaller than Kentucky. This is insane. Yep. But it's very impressive, honestly. Like they've done a really good job at dispersing the population. I think. Yeah, all well, considering that. Oh, I'm not sure if I'm going to say that right, so don't hold it against me. But a lot of the Netherlands is actually man-made. Um, I think two thirds of the Netherlands used to be just sea, and I think that got made around the Viking area. I'm not sure. So it's actually something like the ancestors built a huge part of, especially Holland, where you have been like Amsterdam, Den Haag, Rotterdam, used to be all sea, it's all made uh, around that time period. So that's pretty impressive to think about. Like we just saw water and we are like, nope, nope. <laughs> we're gonna have land here. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's a cool part of the history. But uh, for the people curious, where the gathering will be held is actually used to be land, land. It's not solid, solid land. <laughs> <laughs> it's real land, like rough. Well, the Netherlands is pretty flat. You're not going to find any mountains or hills. I took um, a picture and I meant to post this. I'm like, this shit is basically Iowa. Like it is so, like on our tra- my train ride uh, to the, to Den Haag, I was like, this is flat. Like, <laughs> holy crap. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I was like when you you had you would FaceTime me when you had just got on the train and it basically looked not that much different than a lot of the stuff that I see like around here in Minnesota, at least in the part that I live in where it's relatively flat and some trees kind of scattered about. And I was just like, that's not the Netherlands. You're just back in the States on a train. We do have a lot of nature and woodland, even in the cities. That's something I'm, yeah, I'm pretty proud of. We do have a lot of space. We make space for trees and for woodland. And uh, we have a lot of parks. Uh, I think that's still in Amsterdam too. Yeah, we, we do have parks. We have all parks are all, all over. Uh, I'm also right now um, in the middle of the city. But if I look outside, I can see at least 20 trees, if not more. So healthy, big trees. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it's you do not have a lot of, um, how to say that, you don't have a lot of privacy. So if you buy a house here, it, you're probably going to have neighbors pretty, pretty close to you. And so you better that be a is the co- that's the cost you pay. House. It's expensive. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Now it is here. Yeah. <laughs> the cheapest thing, like we were in the North side of like the developing area of Amsterdam and you know we were in a two bedroom flat with one bathroom and like a living space and it was like listed for 750,000 euros or something like that yeah 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 <laughs> and that's we been have cheaper houses my but <laughs> around here. yeah yeah it, how buying a buying a house here is pretty expensive especially if you want to like live in the nice areas like the better the area the higher the price and yeah it, it's not uncommon for it to be close to a million <laughs> we're um, somewhere very populated <clears throat> at so least to, half a million to reel it back into the paganism conversation here um and not just a netherlands love fest I, I did really enjoy my time there um but again one of the videos i want to be talking about here soon uh, i'm going to film it while actually at the netherlands gathering 
uh, next month is the the goddess video on Nehalenia or Nehel Nehalenia. Um, because this is a very interesting thing to me because again it kind of shows cultures mixing. So from what I could gather from my research, um, and that article I actually I sent in the uh, the Discord, and I was reading through that article, and then my research passed it, is essentially Nehalenia was a Celtic goddess that was venerated by the Romans because the locals there venerated her. And then when the Romans came to the area, they used the area around the Netherlands, specifically Zealand, to travel to England. And so it was there they were mooring their boats and sending them off. And they actually began to venerate and honor Nehalenia as a goddess um, and a protector of seafarers. And they have found over 200 votive shrines built by the Romans to her um that they would put on the seashore and leave offerings when they would leave out and she actually had a temple built at one point that was sucked into the sea which is the majority of the information i have for the video at this point but regardless uh the thing i found fascinating is that the romans saw the power of this goddess and so that's something i actually want to do um claire we can talk about obviously when we talk about rituals is i wouldn't mind doing a small thing for nehalinia um to kind of because apparently she was the patron goddess of that of the the area and so I was like, well, that would be really cool to in a, in a gathering to actually honor and venerate her. And so uh, the thing I find interesting is the Romans, you know, obviously this big imperial force from a different world respected a different goddess. And so, you know, when we as North Americans, I, th I do think that there is, it's not obviously everyone, but there is a stigma on the European side of the world towards pagans worshiping in North America. Like, well, you're on the clear other side of the world worshiping Odin. Where's the, how does that make sense? And, you know, to me, that's where that makes sense is like the Romans went to another land and they were like, wow, I love this goddess here. I'm going to honor and venerate this goddess. And, you know, it's, you know, the North America, we're saying, hey, we feel Odin here. We want to honor and venerate Odin. It's going to be different, of course. It's not going to be identical to how the Scandinavians honored and venerated Odin. Um, but we're, we're going to do it in our own unique way. And I think that the land that we have definitely influences the way we venerate the gods. And one yeah. of the one of the reasons we've got like I think such a strong connection, especially around the Appalachian Mountains, and I think we've talked about it on podcast a couple times now, is the same mountains that are all across you know Norway, where you know most people would say like that's the true home of the gods, either Norway or Sweden. I mean, it's the same mountain range that was formed millions of years ago and broke apart, and spans you know three countries now, three or four. I can't remember uh it's norway yeah. Scandina uh, like all of scandinavia um and then scotland ireland and the uk and then the united states as well yeah i think there might be a part in new uh, new film as well oh, yeah, i have to look at it yeah so for you know several countries that this thing spans across now and you know if you look at like how our community is specifically uh you know the majority of everything has kind of grown right out of the appalachian mountains you know, that's the most central part of it, you know, from Indiana, Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, Georgia. Yeah, that was like one thing, like, I was kind of surprised about when um, moving back to Minnesota on kind of the lack thereof, considering the amount of people that are coming from basically some sort of Scandinavian or Northern European, like, ancestry, when I was like, I expected a lot more people to be a little bit more curious about this kind of stuff and i mean there definitely are some but i feel like it's a lot fewer than i had originally expected there to be but yeah it is kind of funny to think that like a lot of the majority of the community is around like kentucky basically of like of all places <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of all places in the united states it's it's yeah, it's fuck, it's fucking eastern kentucky and northeast tennessee yeah, <laughs> well like i we mean have... honestly to me it's undeniable that we're feeling something because you know obviously you know like with claire you know at, and this is something i have observed as well in the netherlands and germany is paganism is f passively in almost everything like just because it's part of the history here it's part of the culture is you know they might do something that yes is just part of Bavarian culture or Dutch culture now, but it comes from a, a pagan tradition. And so I think there is a much more, you know, it's very deeply rooted um, understanding of pagan beliefs. And where in the United States, we just don't have that. 
I mean, we live in a country literally that destroyed the pagan population there, the, you know, the indigenous population that lived here and then built a modern society based on Protestant values. Like we are so far removed from pagan roots, but at the same time, you know, the land has become that pagan root for us. And so, you know, I think it's undeniable that people living in the Appalachian mountains, we just feel something. There's something about those mountains that call to us. And, you know, I'm not saying that there's not people in fucking Kansas that you know, aren't feeling the gods. I know there's at least two, um, but for the, it does seem that the Appalachian mountains in particular are really waking people up. It's a pure force of nature. I mean, nature is everywhere. Whether that it's in Europe or in America or anywhere in the world, nature is nature. And the thing is also when uh, I've had this, conversa this conversation with multiple people, I'm like, oh, well, you're from the Netherlands, you're in Europe. I'm like, Nature is nature. A tree is still a tree, whether it's in Europe or in the U.S. Right? It. I don't really. I, I never. I've never really seen enough court. It. It has a huge value if you talk about history. Like, okay, this is where it originated from. Um, but it's also a thing of accepting the past. But now is now, right? The tree is is now there. Um, and now we can we can talk about the fact that how it sprouted and how it grew and. Um, but at the end of the day, it's you and that tree in that moment, whatever, wherever that is. And I think that's also something that people slowly come to realize, like nature is nature. Um, and if you worship a nature god that's not specifically connected to a certain region of the world, it's everywhere. It's everywhere around you. I mean, you as a human are nature, right? This whole thing, this whole machine we kind of have is nature too. We're never far from nature. Um, or even when uh, I think that's a question maybe all of you have had like hey I'm in the middle of the city how do I connect I mean deep down I mean if you look at the earth where we live is just a, a very thin layer deep down the earth earth the, the pure radiant energy it's every that's everywhere it's just a little little slice right uh, I don't know. City trees city. are a little harder than the uh, natural trees in the country you know they've seen yeah. some shit it's also wisdom. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> City trees are salty to me. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, I've honestly, to me, I've experienced different deities uh, every time I come to Germany. Like, I, I obviously I've experienced like Balder, you know, in the United States now. But for some reason, the moment I landed again here in Munich, I just started having Balder experiences. And there's something about the city. It's something about Bavaria that I just really feel Balder. And maybe it's because of the multiple temples to Apollo or at least the sun deity, or it's the fact that Bavaria is known for it's like pure blue skies and white fluffy clouds. Like it's the look, it's something, but it's something about this area that I just feel more connected to him. Um, whereas in the United States, I feel more connected to, you know, a little bit more of the Vonic deities. And we have a lot of Vonic, Vonier followers as well uh, within our community. And I think it is because just the raw, you know, a natural world that is all around us. Yeah, definitely. Definitely like connected to places and and cultural people. Uh, I think you also experience in Amsterdam. I think it's, um, we tend to go a little bit more slow pace on things, um, but also like moving with nature in a way, like uh, what happens right now, which is huge movement, which is often connected here with spirituality. And, and I think that goes for the Netherlands, but for, also for Scandinavia and the, the other countries surrounding it. Um, we are more aware of nature, like a lot of more people turning vegetarian or vegan. And um, you see a lot of, especially in Amsterdam, a lot of these restaurants pop up where they, at least half of their menu card is either vegan or vegetarian because it's just starting to become a cultural thing right now in supermarkets as well. Not in Bavaria. Um, <laughs> not? <laughs> no, they are yeah, so yeah. Meat meatitarians here. Oh my gosh, oh. like they are Oof. meat and potatoes through and through. <laughs> but yeah, the well, Netherlands. Germany, uh, you gotta have bratwurst. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, when we were talking to the, the Dutch person there, uh, we were asking about that. Like we were like, you know, what, what's the vegan culture here? And he's like, oh, it's like crazy. He's like, there's like, he's think, he said like it's like 30% 30, 30 of the country is either vegetarian or vegan. Yeah, like at least a few times a week. It, it's pretty popular to have like... Uh, uh, no meat Monday kind of like you know like you have this certain times at the week you just don't eat any meat right or, or fish or you switch to something else 
um, but it's also not that hard here because if you go in the supermarket, I think your vegan or vegetarian options, if it's about like meat replacements, I think it's as big as like the department of meat in general. I mean, you have just as much meat options right now as you have vegan and vegetarian options. So if you go into the supermarket, it's not that hard to choose the other one uh, if you have that choice, right? It, it's either you want to try it or something you do every week or every day. Um, so Claire, you are a vegetarian, easy. right? Yes. So there is a place in Amsterdam called Mr. Stex. It's a vegan pancake mm -hmm. place. And let me tell you, it was phenomenal. Like if you're ever up towards Amsterdam, you should go. Like they had a, they call every, I think it's funny. Anytime something involves barbecue, they call it a Texas something. It's like <laughs> everywhere I went, they had a Texas burger, Texas salad, Texas this. And it always had like meat, cheese, and like barbecue sauce on it. <laughs> um, and uh, this was a, it was again, everything in this restaurant is vegan. It was a Texas pancake thing. And it was vegan chicken barbecue sauce coleslaw and uh like mixed greens with like a cream drizzle on it on pancakes hmm. and the chicken the vegan chicken literally looked and tasted like chicken and like i would break it apart i'm like this literally looks like chicken yeah and yeah it, we're we're there far away yeah it, it was wild it i mean good. i've never had anything like it mm -hmm. but i think and that's something i kind of wanted to go towards is as someone who goes to frequently to like spiritual retreats and shamanic reti retreats I've noticed a trend that it's just normal that the food you're served is vegan or at least vegetarian. That's just the norm at this moment. So the people who come to the Dutch gathering, we're not going to make everything vegan, but it's definitely a trend that's going around right now. Um, like last, I went to that retreat and I had like, everything was vegan and I didn't even, I didn't even notice. Um, it, it was just so good and nobody really noticed. Um, I think we had like Mexican or something and everything until like the sour cream, which goes to the nachos. I didn't taste the difference, right? I was like, this is mind blowing. I need the, this recipe. But I think def definitely that spiritual connection to the earth, uh, vegan, caring about the environment is definitely a trend that's going on around here. Uh, and also dragging through spirituality, like the mother earth. Um, and that also the goddess, oh, I, don't, I don't remember the name. Um, but Nehalinia. Mother Earth, Melvinia, Nehalinia, Nehalinia. Okay, um, but uh, things like Mother Earth are often central within these retreats or with paganism. And um, afterwards, you always talk with people after those kind of spiritual experiences and gatherings. And there were also some Norse pagans there. Um, and everyone's like, yeah, I felt Freya everywhere. Like any other ones that are yeah, just Mother Earth or like stuff like that. Or um, so that 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 feminine energy was very, very, very much here too, especially around those retreats. Mother Earth, caring environment, stuff like that. Um, and I think I've seen it also in like more Scandinavian countries from like YouTubers I follow. If they reflect uh, life there, the way I interpret it. Um, same, but like eating clean, uh, making your own food or growing your own food, which I know a lot of people uh, try or have done or like do all the time in the community, growing your own food, be self-sufficient. Um, yeah, things like eating clean and stuff. Homesteading okay. definitely seems to be a lot of the allure for a lot of the pagans here in the States because it is more doable. I mean, shoot, you can buy land in Kentucky for like nothing, <laughs> which is why That's we're what looking I'm for jealous <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, you can literally buy like, I have seen like 160 undeveloped mountainside acres for like $30,000 at times. Like it is obscene. Yeah, I think kind of like going on, like keeping up with this like subject, I think kind of going back to how, um, you know, obviously Europe is so much older and it's kind of going back to, I feel like a more um, natural cycle of doing things. I feel like the biggest like pushback that at least that we see in the states where you have like a smaller pocket of individuals that are trying to do stuff like eating more clean or being more focused around um you know keeping nature clean and bringing it back to that more like primordial state is because i feel like because the u.s is still very young the lot of i mean we had the, that entire point in our history of western expansion of basically trying to 
control and dominate nature, which is one impossible. This is not going to happen. Nature's going to win every time. And I feel like that is still so heavily ingrained in the vast majority of people in the state. And honestly, kind of like I was just thinking about it as you were talking, like if I feel like if, you know, Teddy Roosevelt had not been president and had not, I feel like felt that deep connection to just nature in general and had enacted, you know, that, that bill to basically preserve. And he's essentially the reason why we have the vast majority of like the national parks and stuff like that, that we have that covers such a wide area. I feel like we would have a whole lot less because that obviously has prevented a lot of that, that lure to dominate nature and take control of it. I feel like because of that, it's, I feel like something at some point when he was obviously out in, you know, in nature and in those woods, he was just like, yep, nope, this is something is speaking to me and I need to keep this alive as long as possible. And I feel well, like that's just a thing that's lacking, I feel like, in the vast majority of people here in the States. It's the one one benefit thing. I will say to the United States over Europe is because we are so young, we, you know, we do have so much land is, you know, for the most part, I mean, there are obviously some places in Europe that aren't fully crowded, but Europe in general is very crowded. And it's just, it, you know, they, there's only so much they can do nowadays, whereas in the United States, we still have the opportunity to preserve our land more. Um, and things like, you know, the National Park Service, and honestly, we've talked about it with like uh, James, you know, with Canada, is honestly like the even the American Fish and Wildlife does a really good job. For the most part like preserving and maintaining the wildlife here um as far as like you know issuing tags and whatnot and making sure the wildlife doesn't get out of control and so it's really cool to see that like there are people that genuinely really care about preserving the the natural beauty of the united states which it has a lot of and you know and that's the stuff i try to focus on a lot is is you know looking at that benefit because it can be especially in the cities like i definitely don't think our cities are as developed or properly planned as uh or at least in some areas as like the european cities um just because we've we've been allowed to just expand uncontrollably in any direction that we've really not had to think about things whereas europe for a while now is like no we only have this like we have to make this work and so i think it's just a little better in that regard um, and obviously this is, you know, a blanket statement, but I, you know, it's from my experiences, but one thing like uh, Lexington, where I'm from, they have reached that uh, thing where they were basically like, we have to destroy our culture to build wider. Uh, because once you get outside the, the circle of Lexington, it's all horse farms and it's all like, you know, bluegrass prairies and things like that. And so the city's having to decide at this point, whether or not they're going to continue to expand outward in the city. Um, because it is growing so fast and the may the big political push right now is there's one party saying tear down the horse farms you know build more apartments build more commercial areas and then the other political side is saying no preserve our culture tear down old buildings reuse old buildings build up and all these things so you know again i think we've had more time to to come to conclusions and say no preserve now and i think you know that's good for things to come yeah you also have a very good example as like what's happening to Europe. I mean, that's that's eventually the result. But when I like look at videos of like US and I'm like, oh, I wish we had that kind of kind of rough nature still here. Like everything at this moment has already been touched. Um, and I think as far as I'm, I know from videos and media, there are still like in the like areas there that humans haven't touched yet and like all oh, that that idea that is attractive <laughs> um we have hills uh, because that you, you don't have that here yeah i mean even like the forests have like structures here like walking path which are like been walked on for millions of times and like yeah you don't have that exploring kind of thing here you, um i mean if you go to like Switzerland and then Austria and South Germany too. You do have those, or all the way up north in Scandinavia, you do have those kind of uh, areas which are like still very rough and very cool. Um, but even the mountains here in Bavaria are extremely like hiked. Like you know, you yeah. can tell like a lot of people 
uh you know there's zip lines everywhere there's little restaurants you'll be hiking and all of a sudden there's a bar and you're like how the fuck did they get a bar up here (laughs) i mean i'm not gonna (laughs) lie it's a little convenient you're like well it just so happens i would love a beer on this hike (laughs) if there's a will there's a way that's something we say often here but yeah it definitely it's like everything has been touched everything has been uh repurposed or made a tourist attraction from and it's also in a lot of areas here in Europe it's our only connection to nature um even though it's the mainland and the ancestor land it's it it's there are tourists everywhere (laughs) to a certain point of time Uh, yeah I mean like having come here last year during COVID times you know and I got like the the only way I was able to get in was a relationship visa um you know being the only American here was amazing Oh my gosh, like there was like no tourist and I loved it. I was on a great experience. But now that I've come back, like literally our plane from Amsterdam got delayed because German airspace was so busy with tourists coming in yep. and they're fucking everywhere. <laughs> yeah, there is no like going on by yourself and have like a completely area to yourself to do an offering or a ritual or a meditation. No way that that's just... But especially during COVID times here, locally, because everything was closed, guess what people did? They all went into the forest, into the woods, into nature, which is a good thing that people like look for nature when things are a little bit rough. But for you having a silent walk into the woods, not happening. Um, so yeah, there are definitely some downsides to living here um, in Europe, you know, from spiritual to nature. Yeah, at the end of the day, and I think this is a good way to kind of wrap up this video, um, and I'll, I'll give everyone time for any final remarks, but at, at the end of the day, you know, Europe, Netherlands, all the countries here are uniquely different in their own ways, and that's one of the things I really love about being here is even in Germany, Bavaria is very unique, and I'm going to explore North Germany later this year. Um, you know, I've been to the Netherlands now, and Amsterdam is going to be different than Eindhoven. We're going to have the gathering here next month, um, or Den Haag, where I went as well. Um, And then all the way up to Denmark, I'm going to go up to Denmark, you know, individual cities, individual regions, counties of countries of the whole of Europe are all uniquely different. And that is wonderful. Um, The states of the United States are uniquely different, even though, you know, Caleb and I are only a state away. Tennessee culture is different than Kentucky culture. Minnesota uh, culture is different than that as well. And so it might be subtle differences, but it's in those differences that we find the beauty in the world we live in and in the people that live in this world. And so when I say, you know, I, I truly believe that, yes, we are North American pagans, but I'm not just a North American pagan. I'm not just a Norse pagan. I'm a Kentucky pagan. I'm a Lexington pagan. You know, Caleb is a Tri-City pagan from, you know, and, and Tennessee pagan. Um, so I think, you know, when we boil it down, yes, there is a lot of differences, but I think that's one of the things that makes it beautiful at the same time. Can you guys top that? No, I don't think I can. Oh. That's pretty <laughs> solid. My like my, I'm just like uh, just as we've been talking about things. Like yeah, it's just making me think more and more. Just how like, just how different. Like obviously everything is with regions and the way things are practiced, but also just like yeah, I'm kind of just thinking of the opportunities that I feel like a lot of people, at least you know here in the states, have that they're not potentially taking advantage of to have an experience or to just go out and appreciate the things that like the nature that we do still have. That's some, honestly something my friends uh, that were coming from Kentucky, uh, one of them uh, had never left the States before, really had never left Kentucky um, for the most part. And, you know, he was so enamored with Europe and he was like, I want to move here. I want to move here. And I was like, I mean, that's great. But at the same time, you know, I hope you realize when you go back that there are things in the States that are really nice there, you know, the fact that you can drive one hour from Lexington and you're in a, basically the Grand Canyon of the East, you're an hour and a half drive from one of the largest waterfalls in the world, you know, and that's what I, when I, when I came back last year, that's what I saw. I was like, holy shit, like, look at all this raw natural land I have that I'm an hour away from. Like, that is amazing. I did not have that in Europe. <laughs> no, not going to find that here. No. Mm. The only other thing I could think to say is just like, uh, with the, the the idea of North American paganism, um, and kind of, I guess, connecting back to like what I said earlier about like the same ideas, different tribes, 
uh, practicing things differently. You know, we're, we're, you know, we don't have a, a written handbook to like what we're doing. We said it all the time. You know, we're trying to figure things out that were lost, that were never written down. And this is like a, a revitalization or a rebirth. And, you know, things evolve over time. And so we're not going to, you know, we're not going to do things the same. And I really don't think our ancestors would want to do, us to do it the same either. Yeah, like one thing, one thing I, I've always had, like I always try to do things as close to how they did them as I can when I'm able to. But at the same time, I know that if they had technology and the newer techniques and things available to them, uh, you know, a thousand years ago, they would 100% take advantage of it. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. That would be the a... most uh, effective way. Yeah, like you have a Viking Viking Joe in you know 960 Scandinavia, and a you know a traveler shows up to trade in their Buddhist, and they're like, "Hey, I know how to connect to my gods through meditation. You know, can I teach you?" Is he going to say like, "Fuck off"? Like, no. <laughs> like he would be like, "Well, yeah, show me." You know, I don't think really any human being, if you tell them like, "Hey, I have something that will help you," they're going to be like, "No." Nah. So I think. You know, the fact that we do have more modern techniques, you know, will, modern in the sense of the new age meditation coming from the past and, and shamanic retreats and silent retreats and, you know, all these things, if they can help us have a deeper connection with our gods and the world around us, why would we deny those practices? Yeah, use the tools that are given to us. Exactly. Something my father always painfully reminds me of. The world is created by bards. Uh, we tell sort stories, we explore, that's how cultures are built, that's how our languages are built, that's how religions are made, that's how everything is made. And I don't think any ancestor from any region of the world would want us to stop doing that. Keep creating, keep telling stories, keep sharing your experiences and go on with them. They had to start somewhere too. A wise man. A wise man yeah. right there. Now just give That's him a, a country in. accent. <laughs> <laughs> Make Claire, him before, sound like people. Claire, before, <laughs> before we head out of here, can you do me a favor and say goodbye, y'all? In Dutch? No, no, like goodbye, oh. y'all, in a country accent. Let's, let's goodbye, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty good. That was pretty good. Scowl. Scowl. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, with that folks thank you very much for joining us for this episode 85 of the folk podcast with claire as we discuss north american paganism and european paganism and the differences and what we can learn from both of them uh so as we've been kind of mentioning claire and i are going to be putting on the netherlands gathering here in about a month which is our first international gathering as community which is very exciting and i'm sure it will not be our last in the netherlands uh, so be sure you're following us at the Fellowship of Northern Traditions. Uh, our website is www.northerntraditions.org. We post all of our gatherings coming up there. Um, Claire, we do not have any spots open, right? We have no spots. Uh, I still have, we still have kind of one because of a cancellation, but uh, no, 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 no. We have one spot open. Okay. So it might be full by the time this episode comes out because it yeah. comes out a week from us recording. <laughs> but regardless, we may have one spot. So if you're interested in attending the gathering in the Netherlands, uh, feel free to send Claire an email. Her website, or her email is on the website as well. Uh, but again, we have lots of things going on. First UK gathering coming up as well. And we will have many more a coming. So other than that, thank you all very much. And until the hall. Scowl. 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 Oh my God. <laughs> 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 <laughs>